Welcome everyone to a new feature that we're calling the Saigon Report. During this video series, we're going to discuss in detail, demonstrate, and fire weapons that were used during the Vietnam era. Now today, we're going to talk about the standard issue sidearm during the Vietnam War, and that would be the M1911 A1 pistol. What is significant about the M1911 A1 pistol? Well, if you didn't know, this was the first semi-automatic magazine-fed firearm handgun to be adopted by the U.S. Army. Now before this, it was all revolvers, specifically the firearm that this replaced was the 1892 Navy Army Revolver in 38 Colt. Now you should know, if you don't, that the M1911A1 was chambered in the 45 ACP, which stands for Automatic Colt Pistol. What was significant about this? Well, number one, up to this point, all the Army sidearms either held five or six rounds. This one held seven in the magazine, plus one in the chamber. Single column magazine. Yes, the original 1911 magazines only held seven. You guys are like, yeah, but my 1911 holds eight. I got that, because they redesigned the followers. But the originals held seven rounds of 230 grain ball ammunition. Right there. Now, what you may not know is when John Browning designed this gun, he designed it so that it could be taken apart, field stripped by the average private PFC in the field using only the bottom of their magazine. If you didn't know, you could take the bottom base pad of this magazine and push it right there and it fits perfectly. That's something that Browning did very deliberately. If you're going to issue a firearm to soldiers, to troops, to the Navy, to the Marines, whatever, you want to make sure that they don't need a tool to disassemble it in the field to clean it. Now, obviously, there are armorers who are going to detail strip them and take them apart and so forth. But for average in-the-field maintenance, right, just G.I. Joe, and he's out in the desert, he's in the woods, he's in the jungle, he needs to take it apart and clean it, oil it, lube it, you don't want that guy to have to have a tool, a special tool. Because what have we learned over the years? We've learned that G.I. Joe will lose the tool. If you make a specific tool for that gun, when he needs it, it won't be there. Trust me, I know. So what else is unique and special about this gun? Well, it has, if you guys didn't know, a manual safety on this side right here. You got a manual thumb safety. You have a grip safety right there and it is a single action pistol. Unlike most of your modern firearms, this one was single action, and how you were taught to carry it, at least when I was a United States Marine, I was taught to carry it chamber empty, magazine inserted, loaded in the holster. Now you say, why would you want to do that? Because safety, because safety. Now, if you were going to be in an area where you knew you were going to encounter the enemy, obviously you would load it up completely, pull the hammer back, put the manual safety on, and carry it like that. Let's talk about how you would carry your gun. If you look on my side right here, you will see an all-leather black flap holster. Now, in World War II, the leather was brown. The one main change between World War II, Korea, and Vietnam was all the brown leather was transitioned over to black leather. Essentially, the holsters were the same. They went from brown, brown to black, and they've got the ubiquitous US on them. Flap holsters with a tie down. How many people tied them down to their legs? I'm guessing not many. Who would carry this? Well, obviously officers and NCOs would carry this. A handgun was not normally standard issue for troops in the field, PFCs, privates, and so forth. If you were on a vehicle crew, you would be issued a handgun. If you were on a crew-served weapon crew, for instance, you carried the M60 machine gun, you were a mortar man or so forth, you would be issued one of these. But the average grunt, the average rifleman, would not carry a pistol. 
Something else that the 1911 pistol was very famous for was used by the Tunnel Rat. And a Tunnel Rat wasn't a specific MOS. You didn't join the Army or the Marine Corps and they said, okay, from this point forward, you're gonna be a Tunnel Rat. If you were a small, slight of frame person, you ended up being a Tunnel Rat. If you were six foot two, 230 pounds, you probably weren't going down into a tunnel. But if you were five foot eight or five foot seven, only weighed about a buck 55, guess what? You were going down into the tunnel. And what would you use? You would use a 1911 A1 pistol and your standard GI Joe green angle head flashlight. Now this one's got a red lens on it. You take the red lens off and you can make it a white lens. And you say, but Paul, those angle head flashlights are made of plastic. They're probably pretty flimsy, right? Well, let me tell you a little story. I can tell you for a fact that the angle head flashlight with 2D batteries in it weighs about a pound or so and will split a man's skull. Take that to the bank. I've seen it happen. I know that it can happen. And you can split a man's skull and still turn the light on and use it. So the tunnel rats, no surefires back then, no super cool LED bulbs, an incandescent bulb, angle head flashlight, and your 1911. That's what you had to go down into the tunnels. And they did it all the time, every day. Ladies and gentlemen, the 1911 A1, the first semi-automatic magazine-fed handgun issued to the US Army, Marine Corps, Navy, Air Force, and used in Vietnam. An M1 jungle carbine, and you say, Paul, I know about the M1 carbine, I'm a pretty hip cat. What makes it a jungle carbine? What makes it a jungle carbine? Well, if you look at the end right here, you'll see something that's unique or different. It's the addition of a flared muzzle brake. If you know anything about the World War II firearms, most of them did not have this, but they decided, hey, we could put on a muzzle brake and tamp down some of that flash. Probably a good idea. And these became nicknamed the jungle carbines. Now, most of you, if you think about Vietnam, you think M16A1, right? That was the issue rifle, but it wasn't initially the issue rifle. When we started sending troops over to Vietnam, our troops were not initially combat troops. They were MAC SOG, or the Military Advisory Command Studies and Observation Group. The first guys, the first Americans to go to Vietnam were there to advise and instruct not to engage in combat. What did we have at the very beginning of our involvement in Vietnam in the 1960s? Well, we had literal Connex boxes, ships full of M1 carbines. During World War II, M1 carbines were made not just by your standard firearms manufacturers, but they were made by Singer Sewing Machine, Rockola Jute Boxes, Remington, the typewriter people, everybody in the United States converted over to build carbines and pistols and so forth for the war effort. Now this one in my hand right here, this is an inland version, an inland manufacturing gun. Now what was the 30 carbine? Well the 30 carbine was a semi-automatic lightweight carbine firearm and what you see right in here is a 30 round magazine. Now what did they call the 30 round magazines in Vietnam? They called them jungle clips. I know a lot of you guys out there are like, don't say clip. They were called jungle clips, live with it. Now the standard issue, as you may or may not know, was a 15 round magazine. What was the cartridge? Well, it was the 30 carbine cartridge. Why were these a good fit for the beginning of Vietnam? Well, not only did we have a ton of them, but we were issuing these guns, we were land leasing them to our allies in Southeast Asia. Now our allies were generally not as large physically as their American counterparts, and this relatively lightweight carbine gun was easy for them to carry, and when you're training someone to use this firearm, it has a relatively easy learning curve. It's very straightforward. Uh, you got a cross bolt safety, you have your bolt up here, your magazines. It didn't take very long for a military advisor to teach our little allies how to use them. So, what was this gun made out of? Well, like all World War II guns, you had a lot of steel and a lot of hardwood. Very little aluminum and very little polymer was used during World War II, and that was okay. It just meant that the guns were a little bit heavier than they would have been if they were aluminum or polymer, 
and you had to maintain them. The M1 carbine was also carried by special operations forces and people who were fighting in Vietnam in the early days before the widespread issuance of the M16. It was a solid gun, it was a tried and true gun, it worked for the US forces, and it also worked for our allies. The M1 jungle carbine. It's a scout aircraft. Welcome back to the Saigon Report. And today we're going to talk about the precursor to the M16A1, and that would be the XM16 Echo 1. If you know anything about military hardware and military firearms, especially in the modern era, before a rifle, pistol, or machine gun is adopted, what will happen is they will put a limited number into the field to have the troops use them under realistic conditions to decide whether or not they want to full-scale adopt a gun. And they also will make alterations and changes based upon what they discover in the field. Now the original AR-15, and AR stands for Armalite Rifle, Armalite Rifle Model 15 was designed by Gene Stoner and his team. Now the original team started working on the prototypes for this in the late 1950s on into the early 1960s. And what was unique about this weapon system and about the AR-15 was the fact that they started using new materials. All of our old World War II guns were what? Steel, either stamped uh, or machined, and hardwood. Lots of steel, lots of hardwood. And what does that mean? What does that translate to? It translates to heavy guns. Hardwood and steel are heavy. So Stoner and his team said, what if we used aircraft grade aluminum and polymer to lighten up the weight of the service rifle? Now, obviously, if you're GI Joe, if you're a PFC humping over hill and dale, you like a lighter gun. You're not gonna complain about that. Now, the hardcore purists were like, ah, it's gotta be steel, it's gotta be hardwood. But the fact is that we can make really strong polymer and really strong aluminum, and there's nothing wrong with it. Now, what was unique about this gun? Well, first of all, it was a direct impingement system. And a lot of people don't like direct gas impingement. Some do, some don't, but this is the first most popular gun to use it. It used a detachable magazine. The original magazine was 20 rounds. A 20 round magazine. Now you say, well, why would they decide 20? If you know your history, the original Browning automatic rifle magazines were 20 rounds. Now they also had 40 round versions, but the 20 was a standard. Then you had the M14. How many did it hold? 20. So at the time, 20 rounds was pretty standard for American service rifles. So the original magazines for the M16 were 20 rounds. 20 round box magazine looks just like that. Holds 20 rounds of 5.56 millimeter ammunition. Of course, if you know your history, the 5.56 became very controversial because up to that point, all the service rifles were what? 30 caliber. People were like, ah, oh, 5.56 will never work, it'll never stop a bad guy, and so on and so forth. Well, 50 some years later, I think we realized that 5.56 will work very well on human targets. Now, what was unique about this? Your rear sight is your windage, your front sight is your elevation. On the XM16 Echo 1, you had the three brake or the split brake muzzle brake in three positions. They changed that when they adopted the M16A1. You've got triangle polymer handguards with heat shields up front. You've got a polymer buttstock. You have a polymer pistol grip. On the original M16 Echo 1, you had a three position safety, safe, semi, and fully automatic. Now you say, what about 30 round magazines? When did those come into play? The 30 round magazine was issued during Vietnam. However, these were not issued until the end of our involvement in Vietnam, say 1970 on. Most of your major battles, the original ones that were fought in the 1960s were fought with 20 round magazines. Because our soldiers had to carry 20 round magazines, they needed a lot of ammunition and in addition to their standard pouches, and the standard issue pouch, as you may or may not know, for the soldiers and Marines were M14 pouches. When they switched over from the M14 to the M16, they still were issuing M14 mag pouches. So what they would do 
was stuff rags or bandages at the bottom so that their mags wouldn't sink down into the pouches. And you say you can carry three or four in a pouch and then right here they converted the ammunition bandoliers to magazine carriers and a 20 round magazine fit perfectly into one of these bandoliers. Now I'm not going to try and stick it back in there on camera throw it away there. What else was unique and different about the M16? Well, they had to come up with a new bayonet for this gun. So, they came up with the M7 bayonet. The M7 bayonet fits right on the end like so, and it comes in an M8 scabbard. So the M7 bayonet has been in service for a long, long time. It still fits on all M16 model rifles, even though we've adopted new ones. But the M7 bayonet was another addition. And of course, you had lots and lots of olive drab M14 slings, which you could put on your M16. Another invention that we came up with when we adopted the M16 was the M16 magazine speed loader. And I've got one right here on my helmet band so that it'll always be there. And what you did was you took this and you slipped it onto the back of a magazine and it worked with 30 rounders or 20 rounders. Then you took a 10 round clip of mag ammunition. This is a stripper clip, put it on there, put it against your chest and did this and bingo, you had 10 rounds and then 10 more. And then if you had a 30 round magazine and then 10 more quickly loaded into your M16 magazine. The XM16 Echo 1 was actually the predecessor to the eventually adopted M16A1. An interesting piece of movie trivia for you cinephiles out there, if you watch the movie Platoon, you will know that Sergeant Elias and Staff Sergeant Barnes both were carrying this gun. Welcome back to the Saigon Report. Today we're gonna to talk about the XM177 Echo 2 also known as the CAR-15. The XM177 Echo 2 was designed by Colt and it was called at the time a submachine gun. It was listed uh, on the uh, table of equipment as a submachine gun, but it used the exact same magazines and the same ammunition as an M16. It's 5.56, it uses 20 or 30 round magazines. It has a three position selector lever, safe, fire, and full auto. But what made the XM177 unique? Well, first, starting from the rear, it had a retractable stock. This was the first ever retractable stock put on a Colt rifle or an American battle rifle like that and so forth. I know there's some machine guns with retractable stocks, but for the AR-15, this was unique. Now, this was two positions. It was either closed or open. That was it. When it was closed, the overall length is 29.7 inches. When it's open, overall length, 33 inches. Now, obviously, this is a smaller gun than the M16A1 or even the XM16 Echo 2, and this only weighs empty 5 pounds, 11 ounces, because, again, we're using aircraft-grade aluminum and a lot of polymer. Now, they naturally had to redesign the forend for this, and this is very common today, but at the time it was pretty new. An interesting piece of movie trivia for you cinephiles out there, if you watch the movie Platoon, you will know that Sergeant Elias and Staff Sergeant Barnes both were carrying this gun, the XM177 Echo 2. However, the prop master for the movie screwed up. If you look at the guns closely, instead of having the dedicated XM177 muzzle device, the guns that Barnes and Elias were both carrying had the M16A1 birdcage muzzle device. So, just an interesting piece of trivia for you guys. You had your same sights as your XM16 uh, or your M16. You had an adjustment for elevation in the front, adjustment for windage in the rear, and up front, this was actually new. It was a 12.7 inch barrel, and what they added was a new unique muzzle device. Now this muzzle device kind of looks like a baby suppressor or a mini silencer. And what it did was it directed the flash and the gas forward away from the shooter's face and it did a really good job at suppressing the muzzle blast. So the blast went toward the target, not right here by the user's face. And this is obviously very deliberate because on the M16, 
the barrel is 20 inches and on this it's only 12.7 so it's a lot closer to the shooter's face you want the gas to be pushed away from the shooter's face now you had your standard you had a sling swivel up front standard like m16 and you want if you wanted to attach a sling you could attach it to the top right here or you could loop it through the bottom right there this weapon as i said it was referred to as a submachine gun but a lot of people today would say well it's a carbine or it's a rifle caliber carbine because again it used the same magazines and the same ammunition as the m16 you may notice if you look closely that there's no bayonet lug the reason that there's no bayonet lug is because the muzzle device is too fat or too wide to allow the M7 bayonet to slip over there. So they're like, you know what, we really don't need it, just leave it off. A person who was issued one of these, instead of being issued a bayonet, would be issued something like a K-Bar fighting knife. So they would have a fighting knife instead of a bayonet. If you would like to own either a replica of the XM16 Echo 1 or a replica of the XM177 Echo 2, you can go to brownells.com and purchase them. This is the XM177 Echo 2, which is more commonly known as the Car 15. I've got the Thumper. Welcome back to the Saigon Report, and today I've got something really special for you. Officially, this was called the M79, M79 Grenade Launcher. Now the M79 Grenade Launcher actually came into service in 1961. So that means that it was ready to go by the time we were doing combat in Vietnam. And of course this was the 40 millimeter grenade launcher precursor to the M203. How does it work? Super simple. You push that lever, it opens up, you load it just like your breech loading shotgun. Drop a 40 millimeter grenade in there, close it, you've got a tang mounted safety, forward to fire, put it up in your shoulder, and bloop. Right up front here, we have a leaf or a ladder sight, which allows you to shoot out to 400 meters. Now some people would say 400 meters is stretching it, but easily between one, two, and 300 meters. Now what could you shoot out of this? And a gunner, could carry frag and they obviously would carry fragmentation grenades but they would also carry smoke grenades they would also carry flares and pop-ups which made the m79 gunner very versatile as a soldier now how were these constructed again like world war ii guns they were made of a lot of steel and hardwood hardwood stock solid steel the empty guns weighed around 6.7 pounds now, you say, that's weird. Isn't that upside down? The reason that this is designed, the stock, because if you're going to shoot a grenade beyond 100 yards to, let's say, three, maybe 350, you're going to have to line it up, and you could line up this sight to shoot all the way out to three or 400 yards. This is me lining up a 300-yard sight, hence the reason the stock is designed like that. Of course, it has sling swivels in the back and in the front, so that you could sling this thing up and carry it. If you'd like to purchase one of these, you can actually buy a 37 millimeter replica of the M79 called the Thumper from Spikes Tactical. Go to spikestactical.com for more information. Most gunners were issued a pistol. So they were issued this and a pistol. Oh, something else that they designed for Vietnam. They designed flechette rounds, which fired little steel darts and also buckshot rounds. So you could fire buckshot or flechettes close in out of one of these. While we're talking about grenades, when we entered Vietnam, we started the conflict, the standard fragmentation grenade was the M26A1 fragmentation grenade, and it looks kind of like a lemon or kind of like an egg, right? About halfway through the Vietnam conflict, they redesigned the fragmentation grenade and it became the M67 baseball grenade, which obviously looks like a baseball. And you say, well, why did they do that? When they redesigned the M67 grenade from the M26, these were actually cheaper and easier to manufacture, and they had a better kill zone or kill radius than the original grenades. So these were an upgrade. Now, did we just throw these in the garbage? No, what they did, 
they gave them to soldiers and Marines and said, throw these at the enemy until they're all gone. And when those are all gone, we'll give you the new ones. If you know anything about our modern military, the M67 grenade is still issued to this day. Why did they call it the thumper? Well, because of the unique sound that it made. This had a lot of nicknames. It was called the bloop tube, the blooper. I even saw that it was called Big Ed. Not sure where Big Ed came from, but the thump gun or the thumper was probably one of the more popular nicknames for this gun right here. But the official name was the M79 grenade launcher. Every good soldier knows or should know how to operate the weapons of their enemy. Welcome back to the Saigon Report and today we're going to talk about foreign weapons or the weapons of the enemy. Every good soldier knows or should know how to operate the weapons of their enemy for battlefield pickup and just to be able to respect and understand the capabilities of their enemy's weapons. Today we're going to talk about the AK-47 as it is known in Russia or the Type 56 rifle as it was known in China. This rifle in my hand right here is an exact or very close representation to all the AKs around the world. There have been millions upon millions of AK-47, AKM style rifles made and distributed. Okay, what is the difference between a Type 56 and an AK-47? Now the original AK-47 was developed between 1946 and 1948 in the Soviet Union by Mikhail Kalishnikov and his team of engineers. Mikhail obviously being the lead engineer. Now the gun was actually put into official service in the Soviet Union in 1949. Now what about China? The communist Chinese essentially copied the AK-47, made it their own, and called it the Type 56, and as you may well have figured out already, the Type 56 rifle in China was adopted by the army in 1956. Now the standard Soviet rifle had a detachable bayonet. One of the main distinguishing features between the Type 56 and the AK-47 is the Chinese version had a folding bayonet that stayed mounted or attached to the rifle itself. Now these rifles are made of steel with hardwood furniture and they weigh approximately 7.7 .7 pounds when they're empty. Now an empty steel magazine would weigh 0.73 pounds. These steel magazines hold 30 rounds of 762 by 39 millimeter ammunition, a 30 caliber cartridge. And in Vietnam, our troops started referring to these because why? Well, they're curved like a banana as banana clips. That's right. GI Joes in Vietnam referred to the enemy's weapon as banana clips or as holding banana clips. Now, what is important or what is a useful feature of the AK-47. Well, number one, they knew that they were going to be giving these to very lowly educated or roughly educated peasants, peasant farmers, or privates in the army. Conscription troops, guys that were drafted. So it had to be very simple. There's a very large manual safety right here that could be worked obviously with bare hands, but in the Soviet Union, and in China as well, it gets really, really cold, and if you had mittens or heavy gloves, you could operate this safety very easily. Over on the side here, you have a large bolt, and you have a bolt handle, which you can grab from under with your support hand, pull it back, let it go, it charges the weapon. Now the sights on the AK-47, you can drift adjust the front sight for windage and you also adjust the front sight for elevation. At the rear, you would adjust the rear sight for elevation. Now the rear sight on this particular model goes out to 800 meters, but the technical manual for the AK-47 says it's effective up to 350 meters. So 800, well, that's kind of wishful thinking. What else is unique about this? Now this particular gun is made with a stamped steel receiver. It was a piece of steel, they stamped it, they folded it over, they riveted it, they made a receiver. Now there were, both in the Soviet Union and in China, machined steel milled out versions of these guns. Now the machined steel or the milled versions are obviously a little bit heavier than the stamped ones. These guns are extremely uh, well made. 
They're very robust and they work well in poor weather, snow, rain, mud, swamps, and so on and so forth. Even though these weapons were the weapon of the enemy, they were respected by U.S. troops who understood that the enemy's AKs were going to be working rain or shine. Another thing that you may not have realized was that long-range patrols and behind-the-line special operations forces for the United States often adopted the AK as their primary weapon. So this is the AK-47 or the Type 56 from China, the primary service arm of our enemies in Vietnam. Welcome back to the Saigon Report, and we're going to continue with our discussion of preferred enemy weapons used in the Vietnam era. Now what I have right here in my hands is a Kalashnikov style weapon. This is the RPK. Yes, there is an official Soviet pronunciation for RPK, but I don't speak Russian, so I'm not even gonna try. Let's just call this an RPK. Now the RPK looks like an AK-47. It does for a purpose for a reason. Mikhail Kalishnikov was again the engineer who worked on the RPK in the 1950s. Now those of you out there watching say that looks like a 30 round banana clip. It looks like an AK-47 magazine. That's because it is. The RPK was designed to be a SAW. S-A-W. S-A-W stands for Squad Automatic Weapon. In the world's military there have been lots and lots of machine guns light machine guns, medium machine guns, and heavy machine guns. But what the Soviet Union desired in the 1950s was a light machine gun that was man-portable and that was not necessarily a crew-served weapon. A crew-served weapon is one that requires two or three or more people to operate. With the RPK, or a saw, one man can operate it. So what Kalishnikov and his team did was they designed a light machine gun or a saw based upon the standard Kalishnikov action and they built it around again the 762 by 39 millimeter cartridge. Why is that important? Because the people carrying the saw or the RPK would be mixed in with your normal riflemen who were carrying AK-47s. Now the standard magazine or drums that fed these were either 40 round magazines or 75 round drums but the 30 round magazines would work. Say you are an RPK gunner and you're out there and you've expended all your ammunition, but your gun is still working. Where can you get more? You can get more ammunition from all the riflemen that are around you and you can keep the gun up and running. Now, what is different about this gun? This particular model of RPK has a folding stock and it is designated as a paratrooper version. The standard infantry versions would have a wooden rear stock and a wooden forend. What else did they put on there to make this a saw or a light machine gun? There's a carrying handle which is put in the center so the gun balances. They have a heavy 20 inch barrel because this is a fully automatic gun and you need a heavy barrel for a fully automatic gun. And of course, what's very obvious on the front is the standard bipod. So you can tell an RPK from an AK by looking closely, long barrel, thick barrel. Some of the RPKs had carrying handles and some of them didn't, but this one does. And of course, the addition of a bipod. Now, how much did the RPK weigh? Standard weight for an RPK empty, 10.6 pounds. So obviously it's about three pounds heavier than your standard AK. And of course it could be fed with any kind of AK magazine that shoots 7.62 by 39. 30 round, 40, and 75 round drums. The sights on the RPK are designed very much like those of the AK-47. The front sight can be drifted for windage and adjusted for elevation, and the rear sight can also be adjusted for elevation and windage. Now the rear sight actually goes out much farther. It goes out to 1,000 meters, and that is because according to the manual, the RPK is effective in the field from 100 to 1,000 meters. The Soviet Army put the RPK into service in 1961, and just like the AK-47, very shortly after the Russians started using this gun, all of their allies started making their own versions. This particular model is a paratrooper version, but the gun is the RPK Squad Automatic Weapon. <laughs> 